Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Bauman and this is part one of the Drawing Essentials program that I'm setting out. It's a three-part workshop series in which I'm going to go over basically what lessons you need to learn to establish a foundation or a basis for yourself as a student of drawing. I want to talk a little bit about how, how Charles Barg is kind of looking at the world uh, and eventually, as, the, as time goes on and we kind of move on to other slides, I'm also going to be talking about how the world kind of appears in itself. Because this, make no mistake, there is a massive amount of editing that's taking place to get to this. We need to only look actually at this, uh, at this example of his blocking, his simplification of this subject here to understand how much information is actually being left out, right? And how that, that leaving out of information kind of uh, starts out. So the principle here really is that we are going to work from the broad to the specific. We are going to uh, kind of talk about the subject of working from the broad to the specific and understand basically how editing works in a drawing because of course your job as, as artists, as art students uh, is to of course not simply taking everything in like this omnivorous way that you simply look at the world and try to draw literally uh, every single part uh, or every permutation of it at every stage. We need to kind of start somewhere and that pl implies, of course, an editing process. So let's look at this kind of long and sinuous line that runs down the side of the foot here, full of information, right? And, and this is another one like kind of vocab wise that, that you want to kind of keep track of. When we say information, really what we're talking about is complexity, right? So that a line like this contains very little information, a line like this one is really chock full of, of information. So when we're simplifying, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of reducing the amount of information that we're, we're actually applying to the, uh, to the drawing. And what has Barg done, right? He's taken it and he's broken it down into basically four line segments. This is, I think, a really challenging thing. Let's be really, really crystal clear about what's happening here. Look at the curvature of this line segment. It's basically indicating uh, a part of a couple different toes at the side of the foot. Barg here has indicated that with two lines. Here, a diversity of curvature. Here, one straight flat line that serves to kind of define that boundary. Now that line has such, such power in the sense uh, of how much it kind of uh, it takes away from the subject, how much it simplifies the subject. And we need to think about why that is. Like, why is this a good idea, first of all, right? Uh, and in fact, really with any of these drawing concepts, I think the thing that you need to express and explain to yourself and get your teachers to explain to you is why they're useful, right? So what would this line help me to solve that is a problem in the be beginning of a drawing? Well, in the beginning of a drawing, we need first proportion. And what we mean by proportion simply is the ratio of height to width, essentially, of a subject, right? If we have one, uh, one shape that is like this and another that is like this, uh, we have a different set of proportions, right? This one is uh, much kind of taller and a little bit uh, thinner. This one is kind of equidistant on, on each side. But gesture can be understood uh, in a relatively simple way. A line like this, right, a two-dimensional line like this, has essentially no gesture. A line like this has a little bit of gesture, and a line like this has quite a bit of gesture. So if this is the, the essence of kind of understanding what gesture is, we want to figure out how to kind of track gesture, right? How do we kind of understand gesture? And again, that comes out of a little bit the simplification that we're, that we're using. When we think about kind of copying a, a curved line like this, or I don't even actually have to make one up over here. We have plenty of kind of beautiful curved lines over here. When we think about copying, or right, trying to accurately reproduce a very sinuous, very kind of gently curving line like this one, we have a couple of options. And I think a lot of us naively will start out by simply trying to just mimic the curve that we find there. And we can probably get in a way, pretty close to a sense of representation there, which does also begin to talk a little bit about what our goals are. I think that when you're doing copies like this, and maybe I even should have mentioned this in the first minute, when you're doing copies like, like this and you're working to, to kind of recreate a lithograph like this by Charles Barg, 
the end result, yes, our desire is for it to be a reproduction that has a sense of fidelity to the original. But the, the actual goal is to kind of live in his language, right? to live in his kind of line and block in language, uh, to kind of take uh, a few steps in his shoes and try to understand his thought process and, and why, in fact, this looks the way it does and how that can be an assistance to us in terms of our journey to kind of figure out how to be our own artists, right? So we need to, we need to dig up, we need to excavate and take home with, with us these, these concepts. If your drawing at the end of it doesn't look like, exactly like this one, that is not a failure, I think, at all. I think the question is, how many of these ideas, these bedrock foundational ideas, have you extracted from that process, right? So back to this uh, kind of long and sinuous line. One of the ways that we can search for what that gesture is, and let's do it here on the actual bar itself, is to look for where it diverts from a kind of straight axis. Uh, so if I'm looking at this uh, gesture here, and I'm looking at the way Barg has kind of represented it. What he has said that is that between this point and this one, we have a kind of low point here and a high point here. Now, low points and high points, essentially, we're just talking about inside or outside the contour. So if something is, uh, um, if we have like a, an outer edge like this, and something is in between these two high points, we, we'll call it a low point. They only kind of exist in relationship to each other. But we'll say also, that the, the movement, the outswinging kind of high point uh, that happens here diverts from that, from that straight line quite a bit more than the low point here. So we've established, in a way, um, a process to kind of understand and break down a little bit the essence of that curve or the essence of that gesture so that we can create a kind of framework that will allow us to do what? To work from the broad to the specifics. So let's look at, uh, once again, the contour, right? And I'm going to remove this little center light ovoid because I want to communicate something. Let's simplify the form of the sphere, right, at the contour into a series of angle breaks, right? And this is highly uh, instructive because it also shows you the power of what a contour can tell you. Now, contours moving like this or turning like this are indicating actually what the form at the edge of the subject is. So if instead of looking at the, uh, at the subject from here, we actually walked around the side of the subject, this, co this contour line through here would actually not be a contour line, it would be in the center. And a sphere, of course, being the same from every side, it would bear uh, a very great resemblance to actually what we're seeing here. Uh, this will all be important and explained in a moment, I swear, I know it's really abstract right now, but we're gonna get there. If we know that the light is coming from this left-hand side and the center line is uh, more or less along the left-hand side of the sphere, what about these planes that are turning away from the light? We can notice that the light is kind of, or the value rather, is lightest here. It darkens a little bit here. And then as we get to this third plane, it's even darker, right? So what we're experiencing essentially is a kind of gradation that is happening in between these plane shifts. So when half tones are kind of darkening as they turn away from the light source, right, we are witnessing how planes are affected by the light source as they turn away from the light source. This is the essence of kind of using values to kind of turn form. If you've ever heard that phrase, it was something that frustrated me so much when I was a student. I came into the studio trying to learn how to draw, and they said, turn the form, turn the form, we gotta turn the form. And it's the most abstract way that you can say, make something look round. <laughs> so essentially, uh, we consider the light source, we consider the planes, um, and we create a, a sense of gradation in order to kind of turn the form or, you know, make things look round. You might actually, because I have a really wonderful mic here, might be hearing my neighbor's dog. Uh, it's making another, yet another appearance on my live streams. If you were here for the Centerline Construction live stream, you'll also have heard my neighbor's dog. It's, it's a little bit of a nervous dog barks a lot. So there we are. Back to uh, half tones and form and light and so on, right? Now, let's say that talking about values and talking about half tones is a very useful place to kind of begin the conversation about maybe the difference in between uh, basically the center light and the specular highlight. Now, this is, this is a challenging one to explain uh, because I think it's not something we're used to kind of looking at. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, if you, if you just looked at the world naively, this is not something that maybe would occur to you first, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, 
So let's say that we have our center light here. Now we're used to kind of associating the idea of a highlight with something that is kind of pointing towards the light source. And you've heard me use the term already, specular highlight. Now a specular highlight is really what we're saying is just a reflective highlight. Different surfaces, right, of different forms will have different levels of specularity, right? Like if you looked at the, the chrome bumper of a car, it's highly specular. If you look at skin, for instance, it's only slightly specular. So the surface of this sphere here is, uh, has a kind of a moderate level of specularity. Like I can't see myself in the side of it, so it's not that reflective. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it has um, a reflective enough surface to kind of produce this, this specular highlight. Think of like a porcelain bowl or something, porcelain vase. It's going to be highly specular as well. Uh, what we'll notice then is that the center light is here and the specular highlight is all the way over here. What is it doing here? <laughs> we have to ask ourselves, right? Well, the specular highlight essentially follows where you're viewing the subject from. So the uh, specular highlight here is coming out at a roughly 90 degree angle from the direction of the, uh, of the actual light source on the subject. So uh, we have the center light here. Specular highlight follows us at a 90 degree angle, uh, basically from the orientation of the center light. Let's ask this question too. How is this applicable? Are we actually going to be using some like a protractor to find our 90 degree, whoops, that was percentage, our 90 degree angle in order to understand exactly where the, spe the, the specular highlight is? For the purposes of my drawing, 100% absolutely not. I think that this is useful and informative in the sense that it gives you the idea that the specular highlight is not, in fact, the same as the center light. And so that you can understand one of the reasons why the specular highlight shows up as much as it is, is because it is actually on a darker segment of the form, right? So if we know that planes like kind of turning away from the light source uh, have kind of represent basically a degradation of light. If we have 100% of the potential light here, we have 90% of the potential light here, we have say 60% uh, um, uh, of the potential light here, you understand then that the specular highlight, the brightness of it has an even darker kind of background or, or context uh, from which to kind of shine out of. Look at the diversity of value that we find even in a photograph like this, which is not of the most tremendous quality. Look at the way Barg is showing you the light shape. Do you notice anything missing there? <laughs> the answer is, of course, absolutely yes. There's tons of halftone that have been edited out from this, uh, from this drawing. They have been essentially simplified. And what he's focused on is the, and especially if we kind of come down to, to here, he's focusing on the dichotomy of the organization of light and shadow. So we have a pretty clear light shape through here. Uh, we have, um, and I kind of actually like uh, shorten this, but I'll go all the way out to the edge. Uh, then we have, like I said, a very definitive light shape, very definitive shadow shape. And he's used this then to kind of create that, that relationship and created then, of course, a bunch of unity on either side of that. Notice what he's done with the shadow here we should find the line of the, uh, of the jaw coming through here, distinguishing the, uh, the cheek from the neck. Look at what we find here. Now, admittedly, this is not exactly the same lighting situation, but it's not profoundly different enough that we couldn't understand that, that, that certainly seeing the contour of the jaw here would lead us into the, uh, into the shadow to find some kind of variation there. We also find a little bit this, uh, this ambient occlusion here that comes under the chin. So we understand that that chin is projecting outward. But he's looking at this and he's squinting down and he's saying, you know what, like the real actual appearance of this thing does not merit a line, nor does it merit a value change in this area. Look at this. Look at how flat and even that value is. Well, guess what? The neck and the trapezius have a lot of depth in between them. And one is most certainly overlapping the other, right? That cylinder of the neck is overlapping in front of the form of the trapezius kind of coming out uh, across the top of the shoulder. What do we see here? We don't even have an overlap. And I think that's, in a sense, very remarkable. Because this is an area that, like for me, in my drawings, I would explicitly create an overlap there because I want to show the depth in between these two areas. 
by not showing the depth, I feel like I'm sacrificing the drawing to be like a little bit too flat. And this is where, when I said earlier, that maybe if there was a problem with Barg, it would be that sometimes he can sacrifice a little bit too much depth in favor of creating this sense of, uh, of like flat shape design that I'm kind of showing you through through this idea. Look at, by the way, look at this just isolated kind of light shape floating in through here, uh, which is basically kind of the upturning plane of the uh, medial side of the pec major or pectoralis major, you know, just floating out there, totally unconnected to anything, uh, anything else. Uh, the shadow is totally empty and devoid of, uh, of value change. You notice he hasn't done that up here. Now, this is an interesting one because it kind of comes back to one of those principles I was mentioning in the very early part of this, uh, of this workshop, and it was the idea that you want the simplest possible expression of the subject. Now, here, we could say, is telling the story, and by the way, all like visual representation, in a way, is telling the story of the subject, right? But the story, in a sense, is light. The story is depth. The story is uh, structure. The story is form. In telling the story of this subject, what he's decided is actually this will justify, this will merit the inclusion of a separate set of values within the shadow to indicate the depth and form and character. And this absolutely does not. From my experience working from sculptures, I would say that I think there is probably a strong equivalency in the values that are expressing each of these different kinds of forms or each of these different forms. So like what I'm saying is basically, I don't think that the shadow through here was so much darker than this uh, in a greater proportion that was not present here. I think that this one uh, just got simplified because uh, it was a little bit further away from the kind of central focus and also kind of probably didn't merit the the storytelling angle, which is really that this is a portrait. And if you've watched any of my videos, which I know all of you have, you'll know that uh, that composition in portraiture, if you're doing it in a non-subversive way, in a normative way, then the composition centers in a way on the face, on the features, on the expression of the uh, the features. So I think this is Barg like kind of creating that hierarchy and saying uh, that that this is a little bit less important than, than what's happening up here. This I'm happy to kind of unify away. And that should be like a lesson to you as well. I've talked throughout this lecture about uh, or throughout this workshop, I've talked about the idea of editing, right? That it is your responsibility to choose the aspects of, of the story, the aspects of the visual phenomenon that you're observing that are important. It's not simply to put in everything. It's to select. And that selection, by the way, that is where I think the artistic aspect comes into to drawing and painting, right? You've heard the phrase artistic license. If anything, and I, I didn't know, I think when I started my education, I'd heard artistic license, but I don't really think I had a functioning idea of what it was, how artistic license worked. Did you just make a choice at random? I think you make editing choices based on storytelling. And in order to make that editing choice, I think it's really important that you know the foundation, like you know the, the, the fulcrum that it's balanced on. 